Hello, everybody. My name is Saeed Wissal. Um, I'm uh, within Valen responsible for a few things, including product management and solution. Um, so I'm really excited to, uh, to be in front of you all today and kind of talk a little bit about Violin and kick it off uh, for the, the storage field day session today. So, so today, as we go through the field day, we'll, um, as I start, I'll talk a little bit about the product roadmap, some of uh, what we think uh, are leading in the market for capability and future perspective. And after that, we're going to actually talk about the software and management aspect uh, uh, of the violin arrays. So this is one of our key advantages, we believe, um, as part of the data center that needs to be more automated and more simplified from a management perspective. Um, then one of our a unique value proposition we bring to the table is our stretch cluster. Uh, we've actually seen a lot of customers be very excited to be able to deploy natively built in stretch clusters on, on all flash. So we'll kind of go through a couple of customer use cases. Uh, without necessarily naming the customers, but why these customers made these decisions and how these implementations actually look like. And then finally, we'll close with a whiteboarding session about what the evolution of Silicon Flash looks like. There's obviously been a lot of announcements in the recent uh, few months around 3D Xpoint and generally how NVMe and, and generally how um, storage is changing with an influx of more and more options within the Silicon perspective. Uh, this is going to be a whiteboarding session by our uh, CTO and one of the co-founders of the company, John Bennett. So with that, let me get started first. And just for the folks that are not fully uh, familiar with Violin Memory and what we, uh, who we are, so Violin Memory was actually the first company to ever ship an all-flash array. Um, the company started in 2006 with the prediction that flash was going to be significantly disruptive in the storage uh, landscape. So set off to really build a, a flash array from the ground up. Um, in those days also, if you remember in 2006, there were not a lot of um, you know, options in the market from a commodity perspective. SSDs were still relatively new. Um, so really taking a, a clean sheet approach and, and trying to solve a lot of problems at the same time. Um, we are now a few years later, uh, 11 years later, uh, and, and basically uh, 10 to 11 years later, and we've really, I think, done a lot of uh, progress in terms of deployments and where we are. So even today, we're still considered one of the market-leading um, performance and density products in the world, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we rack and stack it versus others. Um, one of our differentiators is that we're a purpose-built solution, so we are using commodity product called NAND chips and we, we use those as part of building our system, um, and basically from there, uh, expose storage uh, into the data center uh, with different data services. And really what I think, uh, you know, Violin in the last two years has really been spending a lot of time on, and we're really proud of what we've been able to achieve, is the ability to now integrate in the box an enormous amount of enterprise data, database ser uh, data services. Um, this is just a part of as Flash gets adopted in a data center and starting to be used for different feature, for different applications and more broader applications, this has just become a necessity. So one of the things that um, I think sets Violin apart in the industry is we've always been targeting the high-end enterprises. Um, it's a nature of being the first to market and in those days when we came out with a very high performance array, Customers that needed that type of capability, customers that needed that type of performance, were usually big enterprises that had some kind of an OLTP system. They were short-stroking disks at massive level to be able to get even the performance out of it. So we ended up being deployed in some of those most critical, most high-performing workloads in the beginning in those large enterprises. So when you kind of look at our customer success and, and how we uh, grew in our past, today we are deployed in three of the top 10 largest corporations in the world. Uh, five of the top 10 largest telcos in the world are using us for network analytics, billing applications. Um, with the advent of mobile broadband, uh, you know, there's a lot more tracking of data that needs to be happened, what application and what time is a user using, prepaid packages, et cetera. So we've seen significant um, uptake there from a flash adoption perspective. Two of the top 10 largest retailers in the world are using for inventory management, supply management, and just being able to make faster decisions around distribution, pricing, and understand their inventory levels and, and all the different parts of their, um, of their business. Mm -hmm. Four of the top five largest software companies in the world are using us for either source code management, either building source code, testing, continuous tests. We obviously, as part of Agile being implemented in a lot of these software companies, there's a need to be able to do continuous regression testing. Um, so that has been another uh, uh, really big adoption for Flash and specifically high performance Flash. Seven of the top 15 largest IT companies in the world are using us for different type of application workloads. Um, and then finally, two of the top 10 US banks are using us. Think of credit card, real-time credit card fraud detection. Think of 
you swipe your credit card at a location, you immediately get a message on your phone that there was an amount you know, deducted. Those type of real-time services all require storage on the back end and very fast uh, transactional processing. So three customers I just want to spend uh, a, a minute on uh, public uh, references to our latest <coughs> product that we l released uh, about a year ago. Uh, Feral Gas is, is actually the second largest propane retailer in the U.S. Um, for the folks in the U.S., you may not know Feral Gas, but if you, if you like to barbecue, you may know a company called Rhino Blue. So Rhino Blue is part of Feral Gas. Um, so they, they, are, uh, they are managing about 750 million gallons of propane gas a year. That's what they're distributing and selling to different uh, retailers. Um, so we, we came in, we actually did a webinar about uh, three weeks ago where Feral Gas themselves kind of went up and explained the comparison they made between EMC, IBM, and Violin and why they ultimately went for the Violin or Flash solution, re replacing a legacy EMC disk solution. Uh, and really what we were able to do is taking a multiple tiered environment in the store, it's collapsing into one tier. Their Lifeboat app, which is basically their uh, distribution app that manages you know, trucks that drive off and deliver gas and, and other things um, to basically run four times faster. And, and, and we're in the process of actually setting up now uh, the replication across data centers as they're putting more and more workloads on this estate um, and more and more applications being run on it. Another a customer we're very proud of uh, um, and a public reference is Valley Health System. So Valley Health System is a northeastern uh, healthcare provider. Um, so they are having hospitals. They provide. Sorry. They were consulting. Okay. Well, they are one of our customers uh, and a, a big fan of Violin. Um, and basically, they they introduce a new version of Meditech, which is basically the patient management and healthcare management uh, application. They had some significant issues with that introduction, mostly because it changed OS towards Windows. So they, they were really, I think, looking at how do we get basically this, this virtualized Windows environment performing. So we helped them to be able to support multiple servers. Um, and one of the biggest problems actually they had was that they were expecting to, to, to see a lot of hours of downtime every month as part of keeping Windows current, patching Windows, which was an unacceptable for them. Obviously, you can't be four hours down when you're providing uh, emergency services and somebody walks in with a, with a urgent problem or, or health problem. So, so really that was kind of very important for them to have a very highly available but also highly performant architecture. Then finally, the Levi Stadium, not too far away from here, the, the home of the 49ers, um, they basically moved to, to the new platform as well. Uh, and, and obviously one of the things that 40, the, the, the Levi Stadium is very proud of is to be one of the most technology advanced stadiums in the world, the sports facilities in the world. So for them, adopting to Flash and using it as part of the infrastructure was, was really important um, as well. So, so let me spend a, a few minutes about, you know, Flash arrays and, and you know, our vision at Violin is that not all, all Flash arrays are created equal. And obviously today there's a lot of different options in the market and I would also say it is a little bit like a zoo. There's a lot of different <laughs> animals in the zoo. Uh, some of them are, don't even look the same. Um, but this is kind of our perspective and, and the best way to look at it is also from a product perspective. This is our requirements. This is where our architecture philosophy is built on and, and how we drive ourselves every day as we look at the evolution of the platform and the products we have. So one thing that, that people that know violin memory know that we're a no SSD architecture. The company has never built a, a, a all flash arrays around SSDs. Um, we're not that religious that we say SSDs are evil and you can't do anything with them, <clears throat> but we believe that SSDs themselves, as the way they have been so far, have been a transitional package to get customers from disk to flash without changing too much in the server architecture and on the storage array architecture. So um, why, why do we not believe SSDs are the right way for packaging flash? Well, one thing obviously is flash is very fast. If you put it behind a SAS or SATA interface, you're limiting some of its potential. The second problem with flash is the, the, the larger your pool of flashes you're managing, the better your performance, the better your wear leveling and a lot of other things become. And this is kind of, I think, one other element uh, that, that we are pretty proud of is, and a lot of customers tell us why they love violin, is not necessarily because we have such high IOPS, but more importantly is we deliver consistent low latency. And latency is, is even more important for us than IOPS. We've held the world record of the fastest all flash array in the world for, for, for a long time uh, in the past. And that is great and that's cool and you know, my, my, my car goes faster than your car, that's all great. But really what matters at the end is that latency that does not that's spike free, that stays very low. And basically, the, regardless of what you're doing with the array, how much writes you're, you need to ingest, we preserve that latency. In, we're not, you know, maybe the word is fanatical, but let's just say at least we're very passionate in the company. Our technical teams, when latency is higher than a millisecond, the, the, the team feels we can improve. 
right? We're trying to really focus always at sub-millisecond, 500 microseconds or lower, where we're really trying to drive everything, the designs we do in the product and the way we deliver the, the, the storage to, to the application from that perspective. And this is what really, I think, differentiates a lot of technology in the all-flash array landscape today. The ability to drive consistent, low, and predictable latency. Another aspect of flash is endurance. Um, and, uh, and John will talk a little bit later about in his session about you know, our views of endurance. Violin has been shipping consumer MLC in our uh, latest generation's products last three years very widely. So consumer MLC is something we, we very early on identified both its weaknesses and its strengths. We're able to, to have CMLC behave better than in, in a lot of EMLC implementations, just the way, again, that we don't use SSDs and the way we manage the flash chips in, an, in, an, uh, in a system as smart as possible. So this is all kind of more the hardware side, and again, for people that know violent memory for the last 10 years that we've been around, know that this has always been our strength. The last few years, we've really put a lot more focus on the software side, which is kind of the three other tenants, which is, first of all, maximum levels of data protection. Um, you know, when we started off, we called it the pain, the, the, an appliance, a pain pill. You know, a customer had one app running on a large array that was not keeping up. The array couldn't serve the app, couldn't do the job. So we, in many cases in the beginning, the customer would basically buy a violent array and move that specific app off the, you know, the, the, the primary storage array and put it on a high performance uh, all flash array to deliver the performance needed. Now as flash is being adopted in masses, basically we are seeing um, uh, more and more needs to improve the data protection. And later on we'll talk a little bit more about the highest level of data protection that you can achieve today, which is a stretch cluster, which gives you zero downtime, obviously next to zero data loss. Uh, another area that's been very important for us is in inline dedupe and compression. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about that, but this is a capability we added to our roadmap, to our products a little bit over a year ago. Um, this has obviously been an area that I think uh, from a market perspective, a lot of customers have been anticipating and hoping for Valent to deliver it. But you need this obviously today to be able to be deploying flash at scale. And then finally, the ability to manage the array in the most simple fashion, um, including a REST API where you can build automation against it, is a very important part of our uh, design philosophy and how we've been evolving the array. Um, I won't go too much detail in the products. Uh, there's a lot more information you can find about the products on our website. But we, we offer today basically three types of uh, products. Uh, the 7250s is our capacity dedupe always on product and compression always on product. So really a product that you use for VDI workloads that you really want to take advantage of inline dedupe and compression. On the other part, we have the 7600, which is a performance product. So this is all about giving you that million plus IOPS, but most importantly, that sub 500 microsecond, 200 uh, microsecond latency. Uh, experience. And then we have the 7300, which is kind of what we call the mixed workload or the primary workload application, which kind of does both at the same time. And then finally, we have a product called the 7700 that allows us to create stretch clusters, allows us to scale out and scale smart uh, and scale up from, from a capacity and performance perspective. Are these models physically different or is it just licensing differences? They are physically different, yeah. So they have different type of, of hardware in them. They look all the same from the outside, but the inside they're absolutely different, yes. Can you convert one to another? Uh, no, these are, you, once you go in, that's kind of the platform you're with. But the 7700 allows you to combine all three together in a single namespace and manage a single modular array, as we call it. So this is our basically clustering technology and kind of the ability to cluster them together as a single um, log, uh, logical system, not physical, but logical. And you can cluster together unlike models. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So you can do tiering if you want to think of tiering from a uh, high performance versus uh, a dedupe and compression type of uh, product. Yeah. One important part is that our operating system, which we develop here, we have our own software team that has developed the features on this, um, is running, it's the same OS that runs on all the platforms. So we have a single code image. Um, I'm pretty big on not diverging code trees because that just creates a lot of uh, complexity for customers in the, uh, on the management of arrays, upgrading, etc. So there's a single OS. We call it Concerto OS 7 that runs across all these platforms. So just to kind of, um, you know, from a hardware perspective, what, where are we today? And, and later on, John will go in a little bit more detail. But what we really do is we take Toshiba flash chips. Toshiba is, is one of our largest shareholders, and we have a very strategic partnership with them. We built the Violin Intelligent Memory Modules. We today ship 2.2 terabytes. I think on all your desks you have a Vim, so if you want to kind of look at how it looks like, um, that's one of them. 
We take those and we build a, a rate group out of it. We call it V-rate, which is about 11 terabytes. So it's basically four plus one. And one of the biggest things in our rate implementation is the ability to really manage um, latency and manage the ability when, when, when you're doing writes or raises on the flash chip level that is built into the, the rate selection and the way we do rate from a read perspective. We integrate this into uh, an array which can scale up to three rack units, 140 terabytes. And finally, you can scale all the way up to a rack, which is a modular array, the 7700 platform that gives you 1.4 petabytes of raw flash. And then using dedupe and compression, you could get anywhere up to 2.2 or more petabytes in a single rack. Today. So this is our four generation architecture. To date, you know, it outperforms SSDs on cost and performance. And later on, as, as John talks about some of the uh, uh, differences in, in this space, I just want to kind of highlight, we are continuously ev evaluating SSD, right? Is SSD more competitive than what we're doing? And, and a lot of companies say, well, there's no value to build your own hardware. It's very expensive and all of that. The reality is we feel that even there's, it costs more to develop an architecture like this, we're still outperforming cost, endurance, as well as performance SSDs that are available in the market today. And that has been kind of really an important part of continuously you know, evolving and developing our architecture. Uh, sorry, that, that's a, a thing that probably every vendor says the opposite way around. Yeah. They suit their own, they suit their own ends. Yeah. And it's very difficult to work out who to believe in that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Listen, I, I think uh, you can look at it in two ways, right? I mean, you can argue, well, you know, there's only, there's only a few vendors that do it, so hence the few uh, vendors that do it must be wrong. You could also argue the other vendors having a hard time to get there because it takes some time. Yeah, yeah, so and, it, and, yeah you, you could argue that only those few vendors are smart enough. That's, that's one way to look at it. Yes, I agree. And, I, and I'm not saying one way or the other. Yeah. I'm just saying it's just... The only thing I can say is when I observe the market, we've seen now uh, uh, you know, uh, an array go, uh, be released from EMC that is basically architecturally purpose-built, if you want to use it. And then uh, another vendor this week announced another purpose-built architecture. So the trend is not moving away from SSDs. The trend, what we're seeing if you look at announcements and what products are coming to market, they're moving towards this direction, not away from this direction. That's, that's my observation. And obviously our customers you know, agree with us that buy the product, right? Is each VIM 2.2 terabytes or do they come in various? We have different sizes depending on how much capacity you need and obviously with different cost points, yeah. And I'm sure you'll cover this in detail later, but just at a high level, what, what does it plug into? Is it plugging into like a, a memory channel, PCIe, what does it? Yeah, so that takes a little bit more time, but ultimately I think the best way to look at this is it is PCIe access storage. There is no SAS, there's no SATA. That's what we call violent memory, not violent storage. There's no disk technology behind what we do. So it is a combination of memory technologies and PCIe that allows us to get there. I would call it, if I, you know, if the company, were, if NVMe had existed earlier, you would have called it an NVMe architecture. That's how you would have called it, yeah. So very importantly is that this architecture is not just for flash. We've done it for DRAM in the past and actually we, we have a, a prototype board. Our first prototype that we shipped was a DRAM array. We've done this for SLC, MLC, and there is no limitation to do it for other flashes. And later on, we'll go a little bit more detail around that. And, and we believe that this architecture is truly future-proof. We, we believe there's a lot more to get out of this, even if it's the four generation. We've continued to improve the performance uh, and we will continue to improve performance, latency and costs on this architecture. So on the software side, very quickly, um, we, we, the data protection we talked a little bit earlier about, and we'll go into more details in the software uh, in, in the next presentation, but really an important part of, of, as I said, our offering and being able to be the most simple all-flash stretch cluster in the world is really a differentiator. We spent a lot of time in the last 18 months to develop a low latency inline data reduction engine. So it's variable block length capable. It's today optimized for 4K for maximum efficiency. So it gives us really good data reduction. It's a cache free and battery less architecture. And the reason we can do this is because the underlying flash fabric architecture is so fast. We don't need a DRAM cache to protect it by battery. We don't need NVRAMs to land the IO in that we need to write. That has been really an important part of it. As part of a low latency passion, we really engineered our dedupe engine to, to fo and compression engine to focus around, um, around a very good latency profile, regardless of how much <coughs> IOPS you're, you're uh, bringing it into it. So that means that you do the hash generation and the lookup before you act? No, we do, we, we write it in the landing zone, obviously, to make sure that, you know, while we are processing, we have the IO protected. Okay, um, so, so it's asynchronous in line. Well, so we, every array ultimately has to write the IO before it commits it yeah. to the flash but layer, that, right? That, yeah. That's kind of yeah. the most 
valid place to use an, an yeah. NVDIM yeah. is to say, here's the data I haven't deduped yet. Yeah, yeah, correct. And so we are writing it to the same storage that the actual after post-processing uh, block will go into as well. So we are not using separate tiering in the array to get there. It's a very simple architecture from that perspective for us. Trying to figure out how that's in line, but... Well, if you, if you think that's not in line, then any, any array today is not in line, right? Yeah. I mean, every it's array will have to it. commit. It, it's like continuous. It's not in line as far as a person who specializes in dedupe. It, it, it's like continuous asynchronous. There's, you know, you can call it whatever you want. I wouldn't call it in line. Yeah, everyone else calls it in line. Let's, let's not have the argument. Yeah. Everyone else who has the stuff they call it in line. Yeah, it always lands well, in place. It, it, you know, it had. If you're writing it, if you you know no, look, the, the wor words you know have meaning in the sense that that's what everyone else calls inline. So if you want to like parse this to little tiny bits, that's fine. But then go parse every other vendor's statement of inline. Right? It's inline. No, let's not go down that kind of hole. Yeah. Okay. So so I think um, you know we'll we'll go a little bit later on as well and talk about that. But basically, what it really comes down to is every architecture today has to. If if you want true inline, you won't get the performance anywhere, right? You have to be able to land it somewhere, acknowledge, process it. And regardless if you're doing DRAM, you protect it by battery. You do it on NVRAM, protect it by capacitor, or you do it ultimately uh, through what we do, which has none of the two and straight into the flash layer. Uh, those are different ways of how you can do it. And then the ability to turn it on and off per LUN, including online conversion, is, is another feature we've seen a lot of customers like. So you can actually turn on and off DDoop, um, and then we can rehydrate LUNs on the back end. We have built this all on a REST API, all the software capabilities, uh, and we've built a software product called Symphony. We'll give you a demo of it. Last time, I think we had to kind of go quickly through it, but it will give you a bit of a perspective on how easy it is to manage and, and uh, uh, provision the array. So the, the last slide before I hand it over is just if you look at the performance and density leadership, and this is data that is all publicly available, and we kind of look at Extreme I.O. and Pure. If you take a 40 terabyte Extreme I.O. brick uh, that delivers that in six rack units, Violin delivers today 140 terabytes of raw capacity in three rack units, so about two times the terabytes per rack unit. Um, the spec from Extreme I.O. is 150,000 IOPS. We, we've seen a million IOPS possible in the 7600 and even more. Um, and again, the latency that I talked earlier about is you can get as low as 150 microseconds latency on, the, on MLC violin array. Um, if you scale the architecture, so you kind of look at a scale out architecture, Extreme IO, 320 terabytes of raw and 43 rack units, giving you about 1.2 million IOPS at about half a millisecond. Uh, you have a scale up architecture from Pure, which is uh, 136 terabytes of raw in 11 rack units, gives you about 300,000 IOPS at less than a millisecond. And then if you look at a 7700 architecture, that scales from a capacity point to 1.4 petabytes raw in a single 36U footprint, about a rack. It's 2.2 million IOPS and 180 uh, microsecond latency. So again, from that perspective, the amount of flash packed in a single rack is, is pretty phenomenal and we're pretty proud of achieving this. Can I ask a quick question about the different models and, and the capacities? Of course. Today, um, I don't believe you do any mixing and matching of different capacities within the same, same unit, shall we say? Yeah. For example? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that you're relying on the 7700 to give you that ability to, to mix different um, uh, bits of you know, density and performance. Yeah. But do you not see that there's a market for mixing within the same array, or do you think it's... So How can you do it? And yeah, I think there's a market for it. Well, so it's all about uh, what what the logic is. I mean, we don't support different uh, sizes of VIMs in a single system. But to be frank, no array does that really. You can't take any other array and mix a, a 1.2 uh, terabyte SSD with with another one. So typically, but you put them in groups, and you yeah, put them in groups that are rated. So yes, it's not it's not outside the. It is not outside of the scope. But w the way we are looking at it more is we see a lot of customers saying, "Well, I want to start at eight terabytes." Point and kind of test the product. And if I like it, scale it up. So we offer an eight point eight terabyte entry point product, um, and from and it's you know very cost effective in our opinion. And then customers can actually through software license they actually get twenty six terabytes of physical flash in the data center, and they can through software license upgrade. We call this pay as you grow. So that's how we've allowed the customers to kind of start at different points regardless of the capacity <coughs> points. What sort of price are you starting that? So we start below $100,000 uh, for eight terabytes. Because well the market's getting quite competitive again, yeah. isn't it? So yeah, it is absolutely a very competitive market. And again, we, because of our strategic partnership with Toshiba, we're always on the forefront of looking at where cost is going down at a certain nanometer uh, uh, little and figuring out how to get that inserted in the technology fast mm -hmm. enough. Okay.
We're getting uh, a, a question in from us from the Twitter feed. Someone was asking what types of workloads produce those IF numbers. Um, so these are uh, OLTP type of workloads. So think of Oracle, think of SQL Server type of workloads. Uh, Reads and writes, or yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this is the the one. So we basically, if you kind of and you know on our website, you'll find a lot more details. But on uh, our hundred percent read is about one point one million IOPS. Seventy thirty sustained is about seven hundred thousand IOPS at sub millisecond. So so there are pretty you know high performance numbers there that you can really you know do a lot more with.